Greetings. I hope that you and your loved ones are in the best of health and in good cheer amid these trying times caused by the coronavirus pandemic. This recording is made for the benefit of my second year JMC College of Law students to supplement the review of the first exam on the rules and civil procedure. In this recording, I shall be discussing a brief overview on action as it relates to civil procedure and cause of action encapsulated in Rule 2 of the Revised Rules on Civil Procedure. Accordingly, jurisprudence in relation thereto shall likewise be discussed. Again, kindly be reminded that this is merely a review and as such, the discussions herein are not comprehensive. Let us proceed. At the outset, allow me to provide a brief discussion on action. Now, what is action? How is action defined in relation to civil procedure? In the case of Ingles versus Estrada, GR number 141809, April 8, 2013, the Supreme Court had the occasion to define action as an ordinary suit in a court of justice by which one party prosecutes another for the enforcement or protection of a right or the prosecution or redress of a wrong. Question. How are actions in general classified? Now this calls for a distinction. Actions classified according to the place where the same is instituted. First is transitory action. One in which the facts in issue between the parties have no necessary connection with a particular locality. It is one which may be brought in the place of residence of the plaintiff or any of the principal plaintiffs or the place of residence of the defendant or any of the principal defendants. Corollary thereto, local action or those which has to be instituted in a particular place independently of the place of residence of the party. Now, how are actions classified according to its cause or foundation? First, personal action, or those which, which are brought for the recovery of personal property, for the enforcement of some contract, or recovery of damages for the commission of an injury to the person or property. Second, a real action, one where the plaintiff seeks the recovery of a real property or an action affecting title to or recovery of possession of real property or for partition or condemnation of or foreclosure of mortgage on real property or one founded on privity of real estate only. The last one is a mixed action, one brought for protection or recovery of real property and also for an award for damages sustained. Now let us proceed to the classification of actions according to its object. The first one is an action in personam or one brought against a specific person on the basis of his personal liability. Second, actions in rem or those directed against the thing or property or status of a person and seek judgment with respect thereto as against the whole world. And the third one, action quasi in rem, is one wherein an individual is named as defendant and the purpose of the proceeding is to subject his interest in the property to the obligation or lien burdening such property. Now, kindly be reminded class that personal actions are not synonymous with actions in persona. And real actions are likewise not synonymous with actions in REM. Indeed, a real action should not be confused with an action in REM. By way of illustration, an action to recover a parcel of land is a real action, but it is an action in personam, for it merely binds a particular individual, although it concerns the right to a tangible thing or a right to real property. Now, how are actions classified according to its purpose? Civil action. 
or those which are brought for the protection or enforcement of a private right violated. Criminal action or those brought by the state to prosecute a person for an act or a mission punishable by law. Now, in relation thereto, perhaps it would be prudent to distinguish between civil and criminal actions. First distinction, a civil action involves a violation of one's right by another, while a criminal action involves an act or a mission punishable by penal law, whether by the, rev the revised penal code or other penal laws, or those laws which has penal provisions. Second, a civil action is commenced by complaint or petition, while a criminal action is commenced by information or complaint. And the third distinction, a civil action is brought in the name of the real party in interest, while a criminal action is brought in the name of the state with a complaining party as a mere witness for the state. All right? Let us also distinguish between a civil action and special proceedings. First distinction, a civil action is adversarial with at least two opposing parties, while a special proceeding may not be adversarial as when no oppositor appears in the case. Second distinction, a civil action is a formal demand of a right violated by another in a court of justice. While a special proceeding is an application in a court of justice to establish the status or right of a party or a particular fact. Finally, a civil action is commenced by a complaint or petition. While a special proceeding by application, motion, or petition. Now a question may be posed. What are the kinds of civil actions? Now, a civil action may either be ordinary or those deemed special. Special civil actions are those found in Rules 62 to 71 of the Revised Rules of Court. And these actions are for interpleader, declaratory relief, certiorari, prohibition, mandamus, quo warranto, expropriation, foreclosure of real estate mortgage, partition, forcible entry and detainer and or unlawful detainer and likewise content. Now, these civil actions are deemed special because of their nature and they require a summary or otherwise different procedure. Now, aside from those I have mentioned, all other civil actions are deemed Ordinary. Query class. Query. How do you determine the nature of the action? Now, this is answered by the Supreme Court in the case of Heirs of Tunget versus Santa Lucia Realty and Development Incorporated, GR number 231737, March 6, 2018, where the Supreme Court held that what determines the nature of the action as well as the court which has jurisdiction over the case, are the allegations in the complaint, as well as the character of the relief sought. However, class, you have to remember that the designation or caption of the case is not controlling. What should be considered to determine the nature of the action, as well as the jurisdiction of the court, are the allegations in the complaint and the character of the relief sought. Precisely, if there is conflict between the caption or title of the case and the allegations in the complaint, the allegations in the complaint should prevail in the determination of the nature of the action and the jurisdiction of the court. All right, let us proceed to the meat of our discussion which is Rule 2, Cause of Action. Session 1, Ordinary Civil Action, Basis of. Every ordinary civil action must be based on a cause of action. Section 2, Cause of Action, 
defined. A cause of action is the act or omission by which a party violates a right of another. Now, from, sec from Section 2, we derive the element of a cause of action. In the case of Nadella versus City of Cebu, GR number 149627, September 18, 2003, the Supreme Court had the occasion to provide the elements of a cause of action. The essential elements of a cause of action are, first, a right in favor of the plaintiff. Second, an obligation on the part of the defendant to respect or not to violate such right. And third, an act or omission on the part of such defendant in violation of the right of the plaintiff or those constituting a breach of the obligation of the defendant to the plaintiff for which the latter may maintain an action for recovery of damages or other appropriate relief. Now relevant to our discussion is the basis of a cause of action. You have to remember class that a cause of action must be based on a source of obligation which may either be law, contract, quasi-contract, delict, or quasi-delict. Question class. Is the term right of action synonymous with or the same as the term cause of action? The answer is obviously no. They are not the same. They are not synonymous. How then do we distinguish right of action from cause of action? In the case of Capital Sawmill versus Gao, GR number 187-843. June 9, 2014, the Supreme Court held that the term right of action is the right to commence and maintain an action. In the law and pleadings, right of action is distinguished from cause of action in that the former is a remedial right belonging to some person to enforce a cause of action, while the latter is a formal statement of the oper operative facts that give rise to such remedial right. The former is a matter of right and depends on substantive law. While well, the matter is a matter of statement and is governed by the law of procedure. Another question, class. How do you determine whether the complaint properly and sufficiently states a cause of action? In the case of Uba Senior versus Chan, GR number 215. 910 February 6, 2017. The Supreme Court held that the existence of a cause of action is determined by the allegations in the complaint. Precisely, class, to determine whether the complaint states a cause of action, as a general rule, you merely refer to or examine the allegations of the complaint or the annexes attached thereto. Matters aliunde, or those matters not included in the complaint should be disregarded in determining whether or not the complaint states a cause of action. Now, in relation thereto, a complaint states a cause of action when these questions are answered in the affirmative. Well, the answer would be yes. First question, does the complaint show that the plaintiff has suffered an injury? Second question, is it an injury which the law recognizes as a wrong and for which it provides a remedy? Third, is the defendant liable for the alleged wrong done? And lastly, if the defendant is liable, is there a legal remedy for such injury? An affirmative answer to all these questions would precisely determine that the complaint sufficiently states a cause of action. Now, as a follow-up question, Glass, what then would be the remedy if the complaint fails to state a cause of action? Kindly be informed, Glass, that under the 2019 amended rules and civil procedure, a motion to dismiss on the ground that the complaint fails to state a cause of action is already prohibited. You can no longer file it under the 2019 amended rules. 
So what then would be the remedy? The remedy would be to include the said ground of failure to state a cause of action as an affirmative defense in the answer. Also, class, it would be important to note that what was previously discussed is failure to state a cause of action in the complaint, not, not lack of cause of action or that there is no cause of action per se. Now, let us briefly distinguish these two concepts. When we say that the complaint states no cause of action or that there is failure to state a cause of action in the complaint, there is insufficiency of allegations in the pleading. When we say there is a lack of cause of action or there is no cause of action, there is insufficiency of factual basis for the action. Now, if there is failure to state a cause of action in the complaint, the dismissal is due to the failure to state a cause of action in the complaint and must be made at the earliest stages of an action, and it is without prejudice to the refiling. Now, if the action is dismissed due to the lack of cause of action or that there is no cause of action, this is made after questions of fact have been resolved on the basis of stipulations, admissions, or evidence presented, and it is with prejudice to the refiling. All right, let's proceed to section three and section four of rule two of the revised rules on civil procedure. Section three provides one suit for a single cause of action. A party may not institute more than one suit for a single cause of action. Section four, splitting a single cause of action. Effect of. If two or more suits are instituted on the basis of the same cause of action, the filing of one or a judgment upon the merits in any one is available as a ground as a ground for the dismissal of the others. Now what is being described here is splitting a single cause of action. What is splitting a single cause of action? How is splitting of a cause of action defined? Now, in the case of Malion versus Alcantara, GR number 141528, October 31, 2006, the Supreme Court held that splitting a cause of action is the act of dividing a single cause of action, claim, or demand into two or more parts and bringing suit for one of such parts only, intending to reserve the rest for another separate action. In relation there to class, you have to remember that the violation of a single right may give rise to more than one relief. Otherwise stated, for a single cause of action or for a single violation of a right, the plaintiff may be entitled to more than one relief or several reliefs. It is these, it is the filing of separate complaints for these several reliefs that constitutes splitting up of the cause of action. And that is what is prohibited by the rule relevant to our discussion class is the purpose of the prohibition on splitting a single cause of action why then is splitting a single cause of action prohibited because splitting a cause of action clogs the already busy docket of the court it breeds multiplicity of suits. It leads to vexatious litigation. It operates as an instrument of harassment and it generates unnecessary expenses to the party. Question class. What would be the remedy against splitting a single cause of action? Now, if you are the defendant, you may file a motion to dismiss based on either of the following grounds. Motion to dismiss on the basis of litis pendentia. If one action is pending and another action is filed. Or dismissal based on res judicata. If a final judgment has, has been rendered in the first action when the second action is filed. 
Again, class, kindly remem remember that under the 2019 amended rules on civil procedure, a motion to dismiss based on litis pendentia and res judicata is not prohibited. It's allowed. Also, class, another remedy, if you do not wish to file a motion to dismiss, is to include the ground of litis pendentia or res judicata as an affirmative defense in your answer. All right, let us discuss some illustrations or some examples of splitting a cause of action. X borrowed money from Y. X executed a promissory note in favor of Y. When the debt had matured and after proper demand, Y filed the case for collection of sum of money of the debt. Y likewise filed a separate action for damages on the basis of serious anxiety, mental anguish, and for exemplary damages because Y's debt was not paid on time or was not paid. Y also filed another action for attorney's fees due to non-payment or because of non-payment of the debts. Y had to engage the services of a lawyer. Question, was there splitting a cause of action? Yes, of course. There is only one cause of action in that case. One act or omission of the defendant X, which is failure to pay his or her debt as provided in the single promissory note. All right, another illustration class. Another example. A borrowed money from B and executed a promissory note. However, B likewise required A to execute a real estate mortgage. A failed to pay when the debt become due, became due and demandable and there was proper demand. In response, B filed for collection for sum of money. Now, question. Is B likewise filed the case for judicial foreclosure or foreclosure of the real estate mortgage? Is B considered to have split a single cause of action or is there splitting a cause of action in this case? The answer is yes. The answer is yes. In the case of Marilag versus Martinez, GR number 201892, July 22, 2015. The Supreme Court held that a mortgage creditor has a single cause of action against a mortgage debtor, that is, to recover the debt. The mortgage creditor has the option of either filing a personal action for collection of sum of money or instituting a real action to foreclose on the mortgage security. An election of the first bars recourse to the second. Otherwise, there would be multiplicity of suits. The two remedies are alternative, and each remedy is complete by itself. If the mortgage opts to foreclose the real estate mortgage, he waives the action for the collection of the debt, and vice versa. Plaintiff cannot split up his single cause of action by filing a complaint for payment of the debt, and thereafter filing another complaint for the foreclosure of the mortgage. If he does, the filing of the first complaint will bar the subsequent complaint. Also, class, in another case, the Supreme Court held that where a party instituted an action for reconveyance in the regional trial court and another action for forcible entry in the municipal trial court, the Supreme Court held that there was no splitting of a single cause of action because a forcible or unlawful detainer case has an entirely different subject from that of an action for reconveyance of the title. All right, let's proceed to Section 5, Joinder of Causes of Action. Section 5, Joinder of Causes of Action. A party may in one pleading assert, in the alternative or otherwise, as many causes of action as he may have against an opposing party, subject to the following conditions. First, the party joining the causes of action shall comply with the rules on joinder of parties. Second, 
The joinder shall not include special civil actions or actions governed by special rules. Third, where the causes of action are between the same parties, take note, between the same parties but pertain to different venues or jurisdictions, the joinder may be allowed in the regional trial court, provided that one of the causes of action falls within the jurisdiction of said court and a venue lies therein. Now, were the claims in all, or fourth, were the claims in all the causes of action are principally for the recovery of money, the aggregate amount claimed shall be the test of jurisdiction. Now, this is coined as the totality rule. All right. What is joinder of causes of action? How is it? How is this term defined? In the case of ADA versus Bailon, GR number 182435, August 13, 2012, the Supreme Court held that joinder of causes of action is meant the uniting of two or more demands or rights of action in one action. The statement of more than one cause of action in a declaration. It is the union of two or more civil causes of action, each of which could be made the basis of a separate suit in the same complaint, declaration, or petition. Now, in the same case, the Supreme Court held that the objective of the rule or provision is to avoid multiplicity of suits where the same parties and subject matter are to be dealt with by effecting in one action a complete determination of all matters in controversy and litigation between the parties and litigation between the parties and to expedite the disposition of litigation at minimum cost. It should also be emphasized class that this this provision on joinder of causes of action is not mandatory but merely permissive. In the case of Spouses Perez versus Hermano, GR number 147-417, August 8, 2005, the Supreme Court held that a party is generally not required to join in one suit several distinct causes of action. The joinder of separate causes of action, where allowable, is permissive and not mandatory in the absence of a contrary statutory provision. Even though the causes of action arose from the same factual setting, and might, under applicable joinder rules, be joined. So it is merely permissive and not mandatory. Now in our discussion, it may be perhaps prudent to distinguish between splitting a cause of action and joinder of causes of action. In splitting a cause of action, there is a single cause of action. In joinder of causes of action, this contemplates several causes of action. The splitting of cause of action is prohibited by the rules, while a joinder of causes of action is seemingly encouraged by the rules. Now, what? let's go to the effect. What is the effect if there is a splitting a cause of action? It breeds multiplicity of suits, leads to vexatious litigation, operates as an instrument of harassment, and generates unnecessary expenses to the parties. And it may cause dismissal of the case. In joinder of causes of action, this rule minimizes multiplicity of suits and minimizes inconvenience and expenses on the part of the parties to the suit. Now, what are the requisites for the joinder of causes of action? as provided in the rule that we have just mentioned, the following are the requisites of a joinder of causes of action. First, that it shall comply with the rules on joinder of parties. Now, it must be stated class that the rule on joinder of parties should only be complied if there are several parties joined. If there is only one plaintiff and only one defendant, and there are several causes of actions joined, the rule on joinder of parties may not be complied, precisely because there is no joinder of parties. There is only the defendant, one defendant, and one plaintiff. You do not join several defendants. You do not join several plaintiffs.
Second requisite, the joinder shall not include special civil actions governed by special rules. Third requisite, where the causes of action are between the same parties but pertain to different venues or jurisdictions, the joinder may be allowed in the regional trial court, provided one of the causes of action falls within the jurisdiction of said court and venue lies therein. And lastly, where the claims in all causes of action are principally for the recovery of money, the aggregate amount claimed shall be the test of jurisdiction. And that is what is coined as the totality rule or the totality test. All right, let us discuss these requisites individually. First requisite, that the party joining should comply with the rules on joinder of parties. Particularly, Rule 3, Section 6 of the Revised Rules on Civil Procedure. What then is the requirement under this provision on joinder of parties? State that the right of relief arose out of the same transaction or series of transactions and that there is a common question of fact or law between all the plaintiffs and all the defendants. However, class, as I have mentioned earlier, it is my submission that if there is only one defendant and one plaintiff and there are several causes of actions joined, the requisite of common question of fact or law or that the same arose out of the same transaction or series of transactions may not be complied with or is not required. Precisely because there is no joinder of parties in this case. There is only a single defendant and a single plaintiff and several causes of actions joined. However, it should be noted that if several defendants would be joined together with several causes of action, then the requirement under Rule 3, Section 6, as I have mentioned earlier, should be complied with, as there is already joinder of parties. On the second requisite, that the joinder shall not include special civil actions or actions governed by special rules. Now, this is pretty self-explanatory class. However, allow me to provide some examples. Now, under this, uh, under this requisite, it states that ordinary civil action shall not be joined with actions governed by special rules or special civil action. Now, what are these special civil actions? These are, or examples of special civil actions are Rule 62 on interpleader, Rule 63 on declaratory relief and similar, similar remedies, Rule 64 on review of judgments and final orders or resolutions of the Commission on Election and the Commission on Audit. Rule 65, Petition for Certiorari, Prohibition and Mandamus. Rule 66, Quo Waranto. Rule 67, Expropriation. Rule 68, Foreclosure of Real Estate Mortgage. Rule 69, Partition. Rule 70, Forcible Entry and Unlawful Detainer. And Rule 71, Contempt. Now, an ordinary civil action cannot be joined by those special civil actions that I have just mentioned or those governed by special rules. They cannot be joined by express provision of law or by, or by express provision of the rule, particularly Section 5, Paragraph B. The now, with respect to the third requisite, even if the causes of action pertain to different venues or jurisdiction, joinder of causes of action may be allowed in the regional trial court provided that the parties in all the causes of action are the same, and one of such causes of action falls within the jurisdiction of the said regional trial court and the venue lies therein. All right, let us proceed to the final requisite. What is being described here is the totality rule or, or the totality test, where the claims in all the causes of action are principally for the recovery of money the aggregate amount claimed shall be the test of jurisdiction, irrespective of whether the several causes of action constituting the total claims arose out of the same transaction or if it arose out of different transactions. It must be noted, class, that in the determination of the aggregate amount of the claims, the amount of interest damages of whatever kind, attorney's fees, litigation expenses, and costs shall generally be excluded. However, class, it should be noted or it should be emphasized that the exclusion of the term damages of whatever kind in determining the jurisdictional amount applies where the damages are merely incidental to 
or as a consequence of the main cause of action. However, in cases where the claim for damages is the main cause of action or one of the causes of action, the amount of such claim for damages shall be considered in determining the jurisdiction of the court. Basically, what is being talked about here is the jurisdictional amount. To determine whether the regional trial court or the municipal trial court has jurisdiction, as was aptly discussed in our topic of jurisdiction, if the action is primarily for the recovery of sum of money, the jurisdictional amount is to be computed. Now, if the amount exceeds 300,000 outside of Metro Manila, or if it exceeds 400,000 within Metro Manila, then the regional trial court has jurisdiction. Otherwise, jurisdiction lies with the MTC. What the totality rule merely provides is that if you join several causes of action and all these causes of action that you have joined are principally for the recovery of sum of money, then you just add. You just add the same. And whatever the total is the jurisdictional amount in order to determine whether the regional trial court or the municipal trial court has jurisdiction over the action. All right, we now proceed to the final section of Rule 2, Section 6. Section 6 provides misjoinder of causes of action. Misjoinder of causes of action is not a ground for dismissal of an action. A misjoined cause of action may, on motion of a party or on the initiative of the court, be severed and proceeded with separately. Again, as what we have discussed earlier, a party may, in one pleading assert, in the alternative or otherwise, as many causes of action as he may have against an opposing party. However, there are limitations to the joinder of causes of action. Now, when the joinder of causes of action violates any of said limitations or said requisites as provided in Section 5 of Rule 2, then there is misjoinder of causes of action. What then is the effect if there is a misjoinder of causes of action? Would it result in the dismissal of all of the actions therein? No, of course not. This is expressly provided for under Section 6, Rule 2. Misjoinder of causes of action is not a ground for the dismissal of an action. However, the misjoined cause of action may, on motion of any party or at the initiative of the court, moto proprio, be severed and proceeded with separately. However, however, class, you have to remember, if there is no objection to the improper joinder or the court did not moto proprio, direct a severance, then there exists no bar in the simultaneous adjudication of all erroneously joined causes of action. It should be underscored that the foregoing rule up only applies if the court trying the case has jurisdiction over all of the causes of actions therein, notwithstanding the joint misjoinder of the same. This is very important, class. This is very important that if the court trying the case has no jurisdiction over a misjoined cause of action, then such misjoined cause of action has to be severed from the other causes of action. And if not so severed, any adjudication rendered by the court with respect to the same would be a nullity for lack of jurisdiction over the subject matter. And with that, our discussion on action and causes of action is now concluded. On the next recording, I will discuss parties to civil actions under Rule 3. Thank you for listening, class. I sincerely hope that the discussions in this recording has been helpful or at the very least has been informative. Thank you.